And Happy New Year. Welcome back to Dave's American Flyer Trains. To kick off the decade in 2020, I'll offer and share some multiple videos, probably with multiple segments, of something that's foundational for probably any collection or layout, and that is track switches as part of the trackage. In this case, it'll be remote control switches, but some of the things that I'll share in the rebuild of these remote control switches will also be applicable, applicable to the manual switches as well. And I'll share some of the uh, things that I have run into and experienced uh, in putting these on my layout. For this video and its segments, I'm gonna rebuild uh, a pair of 26742 remote control track switches uh, that are owned by a friend of mine that's going to put them on his layout. And I understand this is going to begin the process of rebuilding all of his switches. I'm going to share some of my methodologies and techniques and rationale that I use to rebuild these and why I rebuild them the way I do prior to putting them on the layout. Obviously, they want to, you want to have these performing uh, at peak performance and as they should perform uh, as a vintage piece of equipment prior to putting them on the layout because there's nothing more difficult, I think, than having to pull these off after the fact, which I have done as well. So let's get started. In the familiar, uh, what we might, I might call the mid-1950s red and white box, are two 6742 remote control track switches. Uh, by the way, labeled on the side of this box is a penciled-in price of $17.95. Now, assuming that that was the original price, uh, I'm not real familiar with those, but uh, if you use a inflationary tool for 1955 and run that price up, these things can be doggone pricey in 1955 at $17.95 uh, for a pair of them with a controller. Now to put these kind of in their uh, perspective, let's take a look at kind of their timeline. All right, this is one of a pair of 26742 remote control switch with a dual controller. Now, this one, of course, is the right-hand piece. Uh, as you look at the base and look out, it breaks off to the right for the siding, hence the right-hand switch. But before we take a look at this 26742, and I'm not going to even show the left-hand switch because uh, they're identical and I'm going to do the same identical work to them, and there's only one controller, uh, I found it interesting to look at the timeline of these what came before the 26742, I think, according to Doyle, was the 720s and the 720As. Now, the 720As most closely matched this one. The A's, the 720As, according to Doyle, were made in 1949 to 56. And this one closely matches a Type 1 of that 720A in that it has these four binding posts with the terminal nuts versus, say, having a Fonstoff clip clip or clips right here. Notice these are color coded with black, red, yellow, and green to give you uh, the connection points for these wires. So the four color ribbon wire, of course, also distinguishes these as being the type one. To further clarify the type one description for 26742, the turnout is illuminated. That is the block signal right here is illuminated. Uh, according to Doyle, they were made in 57 to 58. Greenberg has a single gear of 57, not sure why. Uh, it had a single and illuminated dual controller for this pair. And according to Doyle, uh, today you could get them for anywhere from, say, 15 to 45, maybe 50 bucks. Scarcity rating of four, I assume that's for the pair with the box. Uh, and according to Greenberg, uh, anywhere from about nine to 50 bucks. Uh, and this one also features the regular to two train operation uh, switch, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, going back to the box, I don't really collect boxes. Many of you might. I think that's uh, really neat. I do have a collection of boxes, but it is not one of my focuses in collection. But I do try to clean them up uh, and shore them up a bit, give them some strength, and repair any uh, seams that are breaking uh, just for the fact that I like to display them. This one, of course, is the red and white box we've all gotten used to. I'll use the 26742 that we have here to demonstrate why I rebuild these and how I have rebuilt all of mine. I had a guiding principle when I, re when I built my layout to minimize switches. Uh, I didn't do such a good job of that. I still ended up with eight remote switches, or at least eight positions. I have seven operational 
with a eighth available. Uh, the other switches on the layout, if they were on the edge of the layout and very reachable, I used, and they had low traffic, meaning that it wasn't train traffic traveling over them that was, that was less. It was a fact that they simply weren't used a whole lot to redirect traffic. I put them in as manual. Uh, just to eliminate the one more complexity of having that remote control. But I still ended up with seven, and I did, I gave myself about a B minus on putting them in because I still had two that after the track was down, they gave me problems, and I had to yank both of them off to rebuild. And here are some of the things that I had to do to those. As I did on mine, I'll do on these. One of the things that gives me a little bit of issue are these frogs on these turnouts. Uh, what I have found is that sometimes these things will be concave and then they'll be smoothed down and that the ends will be up uh, to the plane that they're mounted in. So in other words, these tips could be pointed up and I've got my fair share of switches that have those. In order to make them more operational, I've had to file down some of these points. Case in point is just one example is I've had some switches in which when the train is traveling in this direction, coming up this curved section in this way, some of the drivers, uh, either on the locomotive, steam, or diesel, will collide with the switch right there and actually move it just a bit. And the same could be true in the other direction, like that, because the tension on the spring is not correct. So in addition to filing them down, I've had to work on the spring. Now, part of the spring is the rebuild of the solenoid uh, and the plunger that we'll see when we take the back plane off of this. And you can see the inside of it, and we'll take it apart. And I spent a good deal of time adjusting the spring and the cleaning of the surfaces. I don't necessarily over-lubricate these because you don't want them over-lubricated. You don't want ease of movement. You do want movement and controllability but not something that moves freely or allows the train to move them. Uh, later on, we'll take off the uh, switch or block signal cover uh, as well. And then I'll show you some of the methodologies I use to adjust that spring. And most of the time, uh, it is just trial and error to get the tension on that spring properly, such that the solenoid that we're going to rebuild inside of this has the ability to move the frog through this remote controller, but the train can't move it. And a lot of times that's just trial and error, but it's well worth the work because there's nothing worse than having the train adjust this frog just a little bit like that, which will cause, can cause problems on the next pass of the train through the switch with collision points or drop-off points right here on the wheel or a collision point coming in this direction. Uh, it's not that complex, but it sure is painful to have to yank these off and do the work after the fact. Now, I've noticed some on uh, YouTube videos that are using the remote control switches as manual switches, and I think that's a good idea. You can still illuminate them. You can still have the red and green signals showing up, and you can just hand move these back and forth if it's convenient. Maybe it's uh, close to your operator's table or your terminal table, uh, or it just has that low traffic. In other words, you don't really switch these all that much, so why not just get up out of the chair, switch them when you need them, and then put them back for mainline operations or main train operations. And I notice others do that, and I've chosen to do that with manual switches. The wiring is what we expect and what we've grown used to. This yellow and black pair is gonna to go to your power source. Now what I have found best, and maybe it is the only way that works, is that these wires have to go to the same transformer that is powering uh, the track for the layout. And as a matter of fact, the track on the switch is going to receive power through the traditional and, and known source of these pins. The power for here is controlling the solenoid. And it just doesn't seem to mix if you've got the transformer controlling the trains on the track on one tr transformer and then this being controlled on another transformer. So I always match this up to the base post and the constant power post, uh, which is usually about 18 volts on the transformer. This rainbow wire basically is for the illuminate for grounding with the black wire, the illumination of the bulb inside the block, the yellow, and then the green and red, which through switching these controllers right here, simply changes the direction of the flow uh, of the power source and then throws the solenoid in one direction or the other. 
So if you choose to operate this manually, I think you can still illuminate these. You won't need this but you can still illuminate these by simply going yellow to black right here and illuminating the bulb. When I rebuild these, I do a complete maintenance of the wiring. I check it out inch by inch, I unwrap it, check it entirely in its entirety, make any corrections or patches that I need to, to make to it. I try to maintain the length that's already on there. This isn't inexpensive to replace. Uh, so I try to make maximum use of what's already available. And if you choose, say, not to use the red and the uh, uh, green, uh, and during the installation process, cap these off with something because if they touch and you apply power to them, that's gonna cause you some problems and some unexpected results uh, during your build and installation process. How do we know this? Because I have made that mistake and had to diagnose it only to find that it was something that simple. For my colleague and for my own layout, I'm gonna recommend that these painted green and red bulbs, which I call the 1950 type of painted Christmas tree light, which get extremely hot, be replaced with translucent bulbs, which I'm gonna use on my layout. And I'm gonna recommend the same for his layout. Uh, see what he thinks. One, to make them a whole lot cooler and to make them a whole lot safer, especially if you let children play with the layout. These can be accidentally, they can lay their hands up here. And they, as you know, these things generate a heck of a lot of heat. I've had some issues with mine melting uh, or disfiguring the plastic in the cover uh, on the remote switch right in here and all the way around it in some of them. And that's the other reason I'm going to replace them with translucent. I've got one right now that's already crystallizing around here, and I've got uh, concerns whether or not I'll be able to get the bulb out. Bulbs are most easily replaced if you simply take this cover off, and that's done by taking out these four screws here. Of course, these holes are simply to bind the controller to the table, so they're optional. And then you can take the cover off, and the bulbs are much easier to pull out. Uh, untwist and pull out. Otherwise, they're difficult to get a hold of in some sort of rubber mat or sticky surface. Uh, maybe even the things you use to flip through paper are needed to get these off, but even then you might take part of the paint off. But I'm going to recommend translucent. I've had one that uh, it did so much damage and I didn't even notice it because I do leave these on for, you know, 30 minutes or so or maybe even an hour sometimes. Uh, it had, Trent, it had uh, disfigured the plastic, it had bonded to the bulb, and I couldn't get the bulb or this off with any other way other than to break the bulb and then use needle nose pliers to twist it out and remove it. So I'm going to replace mine and recommend he replace his before it becomes problematic. The other thing I'm going to recommend uh, to uh, my colleague is to replace this bulb with a 24 volt bulb. And here's the rationale. You might find in some of these 14 volt bulbs, I think they came with 18 volt, but 18 volt is the exact voltage or something very, very close to what's gonna be flowing through this. Now these things have a lot of mechanical movement. They're slamming back and forth all the time, kind of like Sam the semaphore man. And that bulb gets jarred every time that Sam goes in and out, even though it's in the up, mounted above the platform, these get jarred as well, and they're running at maximum voltage coming off the transformer. I've noticed that by putting a 24 volt bulb in these, that not only is the temperature uh, significantly reduced inside of this uh, block cover, that the bulbs have a much extended lifetime at 24 volts because they're not flipped on at 18 volts all the time, and they are at less voltage when they are slamming back and forth, although the, the bulbs don't move. Uh, it's the lens that moves back and forth, but still they're slamming the structure. So I highly recommend uh, from Portline Hobbies the 24 volt bulbs uh, that I've had a lot of uh, success with, and I'm going to purchase from Portline's also the translucent red and greens to go in here. Now we'll see what it looks like, what the brightness is like, but I'm looking forward to greatly reducing the heat on that controller. Now there isn't a whole lot of cleaning that can be done uh, on this switch here, this two train or regular train operational switch, but I'll do what I can on the bottom side uh, of these uh, switches that I've done on mine. Uh, they're pretty useful. I like switches that have them because for example, uh, if you have them in the two train operation, which is slid in this position away from the Y, 
uh, on the outward position. Uh, these two tracks basically operate independently. If the switch is this way, the power is only going to flow down the main line, and you can have trains sitting on this siding without power. If you position a train here between another switch with the frog in this position and then throw it in this position, this train will no longer move and it can be staged and the one here will move. And the opposite is true or what happens when you put it in the other position sliding all the way this way with the uh, two train, or excuse me, regular operation, then they both could operate simultaneously. I prefer the two train operation allowing the frog to dictate which way the power goes. It gives me a nice siding to stage train zone. Well, let's get on with why we're doing this in the first place, and let's simply start with the disassembly, uh, cleaning, polishing, and then rebuild, and then testing of this pair of 26742 remote control switches from about 1957 or 58 from AC Gilbert American Flyer Trains. Thanks again for watching Dave's American Flyer Trains. So long, everyone.